treasures of truth you had for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unlock and set me free. Silently now I wait for you, ready my God your will to do. Open my eyes and of truth so sharp and clear and while the message sounds in my ear everything else will disappear silently now I wait for you ready my God your will to do open my heart Thank you. Good morning. What a beautiful, beautiful day out today. The attendance pads are on the street side of the sanctuary. Please pick those up, sign your name, and pass them across so that we can see who's worshiping with us today. A reminder to elders and deacons, your agenda packets for your meeting on Tuesday are in the hallway in your folders over in the education building. Um, don't forget we're on chapter four, so please do your homework. Uh, there are some inserts in your bulletin today, some exciting things going on. Thursday, we have a potluck lunch and bingo following. So if you'd like to join us, uh, there's a sign-up sheet as you enter the sanctuary. There's one in Fellowship Hall. Uh, let us know that you're coming, and we'll see you at noon on Thursday in Fellowship Hall. And then the other insert, oh my goodness, one side for the women, one side for the men. We have two wonderful, wonderful events coming up for people in, uh, in our congregation and for your friends. We invite you to bring friends and neighbors to both of these events. So check that out. Today, um, we are going to have uh, in Fellowship Hall a chance to meet and further speak with Joel um, Drankpol. He's here from Front Porch Ministry. Steve will be introducing him later. But uh, we encourage you to stay around afterwards when you, after you watch the video that he has brought and hear what he has to say. I think you'll be enthusiastic to come over and find out a little bit more. So we'll see you in Fellowship Hall after worship. We have some birthdays coming up this week. On Wednesday, Sandra Crespo. Uh, Sandra usually goes to the park worship, but she's been a part of the 930 worship for a long time also. And Jerry Mead, both of them on Wednesday. And then just sort of a heads up, next Sunday, Diana Leone has a birthday. So keep that in mind. With that, Pastor Bob will call us to worship.
Good morning, church. Welcome to worship. This morning, Pastor Ron's going to preach on grace. And so, as I was thinking about that, I was reminded of Psalm 103 that I'd just like to read as we come to worship, and may we worship around God's word today. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us worship together. In 1 Peter 5, 7, there's an encouragement to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. And this morning, we're going to take some time in silence to cast our cares to the Lord, to pray for people that are concerned for you or um, whatever is on your heart this morning. Let's take some time in quiet prayer, and then I'll um, conclude our time with the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we come to you casting our cares on you because you love us and you care for us. Thank you, God, that not are you not only are you the God of create, creation and earth, Lord, you are the God that intimately speaks to us and hears us when we come to you. Or we're blessed as Christians to be able to know the living God. We are blessed to have the Holy Spirit take our cares to you even before they come to our minds and our hearts or to our lips. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you make all this possible. We pray this morning that, Lord, you would take each care that has been prayed to you in silence, that you would, that you would take those cares and that you would bring them answers in your time and your way. Oh, Lord, have your way in our lives. But that's the way of life. Lord, we come to you 
And we lift our world to you, our country to you. And a concern for me, God, is to see the violence continuing to grow and grow. So, Lord, we pray your peace upon our nation, your peace upon our city, and your peace upon the world. So, Lord, we bring all these things to you, and we pray in the name of Jesus and also in the way he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture this morning is Ephesians 2, 1 to 2, and 4 to 10. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and sealed us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Let's stand together and sing, In Christ Alone. As Bob was reading, I thought of these words. As he stands in victory, we've just celebrated Easter, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine. We are bought with the precious blood of Christ. Let's sing together, In Christ Alone. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my hope, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest God has sown. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world, a darkness stain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, 
And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his, and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. seated. Uh, the next song is probably new to us, although it was written in the 1800s. Some of you may recognize the words, there's a wideness in God's mercy. And I thought it'd be appropriate to learn this as we hear Ronnie preach on the effect of God's grace on our lives. The tune you'll probably recognize. So uh, sing along as you get used to the tune and the words. We will teach it to you and hopefully do it in future services. Okay, one. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's masterpiece. 
He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today I want to speak to you about the grace of God that changes our lives, our hearts, that transforms us. Many of you have heard the phrase, we are saved by grace through faith alone. I wonder how many of us hear the phrase, we are changed by grace through faith alone. The source of our right relationship with God is grace. Faith is what receives that grace, but grace is the source. And many of you have heard that grace is love and forgiveness and mercy that you don't work for, that you don't earn. But how many of you know that grace is also power? It's ability. It's the ability, for example, for someone who's looking for power to work a recovery program. It's the ability that somebody needs who's been an angry bird to be a nice person. How many of you want to be nice? Grace is what I need, what we need, when there's more tasks on the calendar than time. Grace is what we need when we have family patterns and it just seems that the same old, same old dispositions, habits, etc., are falling to us. Grace is what we need, power and ability that comes from God to transcend our natural inclinations, which sometimes are bad if you're like me. Grace is what we need when we're trying to climb a mountain that seems formidable and too big for us to climb on our own strength. Grace is what we need when we're trying to be the first one, perhaps, in our family to go to college or to break the cycle of poverty. Grace is anything that you do not manufacture yourself. It's a gift from God. It's God's stuff, or a lack of better words, where God makes you more than what you are left to yourself. I want to be, I need to change. I need to change every day in the way I roll as a, as a husband, the way I roll as a friend, the way I roll as a minister. I always need to change. Anybody with me? Do you need to change? I need to change. And if you don't want to change, that's where you need change right there. <laughs> we need to change. So change comes by grace. And today is just an intro because we have a friend here from up north from uh, Cal Poly who's going to share about front porch. It's exciting. And I want to apologize, Joel, in advance. I have to be at Living Hope, so I'm going to get out of Dodge and I'm not going to be able to hear your presentation. But we need grace. And that's today's going to be like an intro. I'm going to read to you about four passages, share some thoughts. And then next week, I want to share with you how grace is how we change, not by making ourselves a renovation project, not by using our own strength and resources, not by using shame-based guilt or religion, or turning over a new leaf or making a resolution or trying harder. Grace is what really changes my heart. Grace is what really transforms me, a little here, a little there, slowly into the image of Christ. So let's read the Word of God as we Look at this long intro to set up this sermon series. The grace is what really transforms and changes our life. First, we see in the passage that we are raised up with Christ. It says, even though you were dead because of your sins, we start out in a bad situation, dead in the water. He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And then parentheses, it is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us up from the dead. So grace is what caused us to, be, to go from being flatline, no interest in God, not getting God, no appetite for God, finding him boring. Grace made us alive to now where we have new want-tos, a want-to to become like Jesus, a want-to to follow God, a want-to to love people. He's made us alive and united us with the life of Christ, so now we're in right relationship with God. We have everlasting life with him. And in verse 4, after it describes my predicament that I was dead in the water, it says, but God. That might be another way of describing grace. I was tired. I wanted to hit that guy over the head with a two-by-four. But God gave me love and forgiveness to pray for him every day. I was a groucho, but God has changed my heart. 
or I don't always look like I bit a lemon, and now I'm kind of nice to be around with. I had more bills than month, but God put work inside of my heart, gave me a financial plan, put some unction in my function. I got moving and grooving, shaking and baking, and by the grace of God, the moolah matched up with the bills. I was tired of my boss. I was tired of my wife or husband. No, that's another church. I was tired of somebody, but God gave me his eyeballs, his perspective, the way he sees that person. So grace is but God. I was tired, but God helped me. I was sinful and dead to God, but God made me alive. I continue to sin, but God sent Jesus to the cross to take the punishment of all my sins. I was afraid, but I threw up some prayers, and but God put some courage inside of my heart. So what is grace? It's but God. I'm out of moolah, but God. I'm out of holiness, but God. I'm out of strength, but God. That's grace, but God. Secondly, grace changes me and you through faith. For we are God's poema. Why do I sometimes say in the Greek? Because the Bible, the New Testament, was written in Aramaic and Greek. And sometimes there's just a little more emphasis when you share what the original meaning is. And one of the meanings of that word poema, it's workmanship, somebody's work, somebody's masterpiece, somebody's renovation project. By grace, you and I have become God's renovation project. We have become his restoration project. By grace, we are his workmanship, and we're created to do good things that he planned for us. The Apostle Paul picks up this idea when he says in Romans 8, 29, that he predestined us to be made and crafted into the image of Jesus. How many of you want to be like Jesus? Oh, my wife wants me to be like Jesus. My, my kids want me to be like Jesus. You want me to be like Jesus. How is that going to happen? By me pulling my own bootstraps up, doing this more, trying harder, doing that? Actually, that's just going to make it worse. That's going to create what somebody shared with me a couple of weeks as a, uh, they shared this piece of wisdom with me that you just become like a pressure cooker. The harder you try and shoving things down, it's just... So we need grace to be changed in the heart, not behavior modification. But the potter touching me, the clay, and making me more like Jesus. I need grace in my life. Not my own ability, which eventually runs out. Not my own discipline, which runs out. I need grace that starts and does not stop. That's why Paul told the Philippians, I am persuaded that he who began a good ergon, a work, will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus it's so faithful. That's what grace is. I started you to be my masterpiece, and I'm not going to quit until you're finally in front of God and you're like Christ. Here a little bit, there a little bit. Always prone to do stupid things, but slowly becoming more like Jesus. The grace of God. When I was young, and I still see OGs doing this. I remember some guys will go to Lancaster or somewhere in the desert, Victorville, and get an old 47 Fleet Line, 52 Chevy, a 64, bring it to town. It was a hunk of junk, all shot out. And well, what a homie, that's a, hope, a, a, a hunk of junk, homie. I'm not going to cruise with you yet. And then they would work hard for a couple years, and then they'd put Bondo on it, spray it gray. Still didn't want to roll with you. Roll around with a primer bomb. You ever guys ever see a primer bomb? And then another year making money. And then they'd show up like, dang, that ride is like Ventura low rider car show status. They took a hunk of junk and turned it into a masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. I'm not saying you're God's low rider, but you're God's masterpiece. 
where he takes you, where people, to our own perspective, like I have no ability to be what I was made. I see the image of where I was supposed to be like, but I can't really get there. And just like some of those young guys used to take a car that nobody wanted, was out in the junkyard, they took it, made it their masterpiece, their renovation project, and then boom! You know, that's the grace of God in your life, what he's doing. We are created to become like Jesus. Romans 8, verse uh, 29 to about 31. He chose you, just like those guys would roam around looking for the right car. Jesus chose you, and he's chosen you to become like Jesus. And faith receives that. I don't look like Jesus. I don't smell like Jesus. I don't behave like Jesus, but I'm trusting in you. You're going to make me respond like Jesus. You're going to help me to be Jesus-minded, to have a Jesus heart. Because right now, my heart is anything but like Jesus. Let me read you a few scriptures, and then I'll end. Titus chapter 2, 11 and 12. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no. Grace of God teaches me to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. So grace doesn't teach me to say I have a license to sin, I have a license to cruise, I have a license to take it easy because I'm going to heaven. It says grace teaches me to say no to things that break God's heart, and they are antithetical to becoming like Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15.10 but by the grace of God, this is the Apostle Paul, by the way. And before he was the Apostle Paul, he was a religious nut, and he hunted down the church. He hated the church. He persecuted the church, jailed the church, and he thought Jesus was a really crazy, bad, ugly idea. But if you know his story, he ran into grace and fell in love with Jesus and fell in love with God's people, and God used him to become a planet shaker, shook the planet for Jesus. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. See, Popeye didn't make that statement. And his grace to me was, with, was not without effect. In other words, I just didn't join First Presbyterian Church and say, I'm saved by grace, I'm going to heaven. He says it was without effect. Something happened. No, I worked harder. The grace of God causes us to work hard. Working hard at sticking with it. In that marriage relationship, working hard, perhaps, to start something new for God, a new ministry, a new business. It works hard when you want to give up and you don't see a reason to get up out of bed. The, word, the grace of God is not sitting on the rusty, dusty, being all content. The, the, the grace of God causes you to want to work. I got to make things better. I need to become like Jesus. I want to become like Jesus slowly. I want Jesus' touch and reality to be around my community, around my home. The grace of God gets us to work. It'll put some pep in your step. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. I want to have that testimony. I worked harder than I did last year. I was a better husband than I was last year. But it wasn't me, it was the grace of God. I was nicer I was, more, I was less selfish, but it wasn't me. It was the grace of God. I worked at it, but it was God in me, causing me to work, to, to put in work, to find spaces where I could meet Jesus and become like him, to find groups of people and work with them on a Jesus project. So I want that to be our testimony. 2 Corinthians 8.13, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that was that God has given to the Macedonians. That means grace, God gives grace to certain churches. How many of you know we need grace here, right? In the midst of their severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. They, they, they were poor. They couldn't even afford the R. They weren't poor. They were poor. They said they were like poor. And they were going through trials. It welled up in rich generosity, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. See, grace is beyond our ability. Entirely on their own. 
He says, I didn't have to call him up and say, I'm going to give you special oil if you support the ministry. I'm not going to give you a prayer shawl. I'm not going to promise you that God's going to make everything nice and cute and give you prosperity. It says, on their own, their heart changed. Grace transformed them where they were poor, but they said, we feel like we're rich. We have everything. We, we're in awe that God loves us. We're in awe that we're in God's community, and we want to help because the grace of God filled the hole in their heart that was the size of the Grand Canyon, shut off the vacuums, and instead of gimme, gimme, my name's Jimmy, it was I want to help. I want to be hands and feet of Jesus. I want to meet needs because from their perspective, Grace made them feel, it was a living presence in their life, though by the Holy Spirit, I am enriched in my life, and I want to help. I want to give. Grace transforms our heart. Grace transforms. When you start doing things above your own ability, getting out of your comfort zone, stepping out of the boat, and doing things that are unnatural to you, that's a sign that you're encountering the grace of God that transforms. As anybody could go to church. Anybody could get religious, but not everybody could change. And the grace of God changes us. Not church, not religious philosophy, not Bible study on its own, but encountering the grace of God that transforms our hearts, ravishes our hearts, and says, I want more of you and I can't help myself, and I want to grow in you, I want to be like you, I want to give The grace of God transforms and makes us what we're not. It makes us God's masterpiece to become like Jesus. Beyond their ability, on their own, they gave because of God's grace. One last one. I hope I didn't say the last scripture was my last scripture. I I need grace to tell the truth. What happens, this is how not to change. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. And he's talking, he's writing to Hebrew folks, churchy folks, people who are disciplined, goody two-shoes. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up and causes trouble and defiles many. To be defiled means to be made dirty, unworthy, unclean, religiously um, disqualified, Kind of like, in other words, your community is going to get tore up. Your community is going to get messed up. It's going to like, it's going to be bad. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. Esau was a child of Jacob who was an ancestor of Abraham. He was... In the religious family, he was, had a special calling on his life. But he was godless, for who, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his, this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change. We're talking about change today, right? He could not change what he had done. He says, don't fall short of the grace of God because without it, you cannot change. And he tried. Bless me. I want to be blessed. I want my life to be better. Tears are coming down his eyes. Make my life better. Bless me. But the blessing was to be transformed is what Hebrews is talking about. He's saying, you guys are ranking out on God. You're all shaky at the knees, changing your mind not being single-minded, going back to the old religion, self-help, self-renovation, your own strength, forgetting that it's about Jesus because you're enamored with big religious buildings and institutions. Don't fall short of the grace of God because without it, you're going to be like Esau. You're not going to change. Just behavior modification. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Talk about that next week when we get to Romans 7. We could change, you know, he drank that formula to divide his two natures. It's kind of like religion. But as you know, he eventually succumbed and became totally like Dr., was it Mr. Hyde? Yeah, I confuse him. 
So making yourself, saving yourself, renovating yourself, Mr. Hyde's going to win out, and you become Mr. Hyde permanently. That's what's going on in the Hebrews. They're totally and finally ranking out on God. So how do we not be that way? Grace of God. I'm trusting in you. I'm trusting in you because last time, my temper got the best of me. I'm trusting in you because last week, I was a tightwad. I'm trusting in you because there's still grandpa's racism in the back of my brain. I'm trusting in you. I need you to make me alive and raise me with you in this one area of life because this ability is dead in me. And, and we'll talk more about that next week. Heavenly Father, thank you for the amazing grace of God. Fill us up with it. And we trust in you that you're making us like Jesus. And we thank you that even though we fail, we can get up 70 times 7 and look for your grace to make us different. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Joel. We've already introduced him a little bit. Joel Drinkpole, come on up. And uh, yeah, you can give him a hand. <laughs> and he's going to share with us about the ministry at uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. As you all may know, universities are a place, can be a place of darkness, but uh, Let's hear what Front Porch is doing at San Luis Obispo, and I'll let Joel talk about it. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, again, my name is Joel Drinkpole. It's so good to be here. Um, thanks for having me this morning, Steve. Thanks for inviting me to come. Um, if you didn't know, this church for quite some time has supported something called Front Porch, um, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, but again, thank you. Even though if you didn't know you were supporting Front Porch, um, you have been supporting an amazing ministry that I've had the privilege of being a part of. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, my wife and I and our three kids moved to San Luis Obispo. Our kids at the time were tiny. Uh, our oldest was a first grader. Our youngest was three. And now we've been there 10 years. Our oldest is 17. Um, and then we have a 15-year-old and a 13-year-old. And it has been quite the experience. Um, at the time when we moved, I was a little bit disenfranchised with the church. Um, I had grown up in the church. I'd been a part of it my entire life, and I am someone who at a very young age fell in love with Jesus, uh, and I fell in love with who Jesus was and the way that Jesus loved people and the way that exactly what um, Ronnie was talking about this morning. And that song that you picked out this morning, both Ronnie's sermon and the, the song, there's a wideness in God's mercy speak, I think, beautifully to, to what I've experienced and what, we're try, what we try to do at Front Porch. But again, I fell in love with Jesus, and I fell in love with the way that Jesus loved people and interacted with people and met people where they were at. Um, and that was something, at least in my experience of the church, I wasn't seeing. Um, I was seeing something a little bit different. Um, and so I was struggling with that. Um, and I had gone through the ordination process in the church um, to become a pastor. And then I found myself after I had, was ready to be ordained that, you know what, I don't think I want to do this. Um, but somehow God called me to Front Porch and I ended up there. Um, and it's a, it's a place that's re immediately adjacent to Cal Poly's campus. And it's the, at the time when, 10 years ago, it was this small little Christian ministry that was attracting people primarily who identified as Christians, um, which was great. It was doing good things. But I got there, and I saw thousands of students walking by this facility every single day um, because it sits right at this, uh, this corner uh, where two streets, this intersection, where thousands of students walk on and off campus every single day. And they just walked by. Um, and yet we had this little group that would meet almost like a, a small church youth group, about 20 students that would come in there and they would hang out and utilize this nice big facility that we had. And yet I was left wanting more. Um, I felt that God was, had something bigger in store. Um, and so we just started changing the way that we talked. We started changing the way that we um, interacted with students. We started changing our perspective on it. Um, instead of it being something, most college ministries, if you don't know, the majority of them have as their goal, and this, I don't know if this will shock you or not, but most college ministries have their goal to convert people from uh, point A to point B to, to become Christians, and, and that's great. That was not going to be our goal. Our goal was going to be to meet them with the radical love of God and just see what happens. Um, and we were going to love them like crazy. Um, and our goal wasn't going to be to convert. If they 
convert to Christianity, great. But that wasn't going to be our ministry's goal. Again, our ministry was just going to be to love them radically with a radical hospitality. And so we began doing that. And slowly but surely over the course of the 10 years, we have grown from something that was about 20 students hanging out in a great big building um, to having about 500 students come through our doors every single day. Um, we meet with thousands of students every week. We have a team of 130 volunteers who make our place run every single day. Um, we have meals on Wednesday nights where we serve students uh, a home-cooked meal from the community, about 350 students every single Wednesday. Um, and we do it all in the name of Jesus. We do it all in the name of God's love, believing that if we meet them with a radical love, that exactly what Ronnie was talking about this morning, that transformation will happen. Um, and all we have to do is show up and, and love them like crazy and transformation will begin to happen and then we get to walk with them through that process. And so it has been an amazing journey over the course of the past 10 years. I have seen God do things that I never could have imagined possible in students' lives. Um, and what's amazing to see is that the, the end of these students' time at Cal Poly, because again, we're with them for this really brief window of their life. Um, we have about four to five years with them, but a very uh, a very important time in their life because just a lot is going on, like what Steve said. Uh, but the majority of the students that have come through Cal Poly and had, a, and had some sort of interaction with Front Porch have said at the end of their time, and I, I hear this every single year from hundreds of students, that the most transformative piece of their entire experience at Cal Poly was their time at Front Porch. And that is such a humbling thing um, because it's the love of God that is transforming their lives. And then they go out into the world and they're doing things just like Front Porch, um, which is an amazing, amazing thing. So um, I'm going to, in a minute, we're going to show a little video that's just one story from a girl named Annalisa who is a part of our ministry. She now lives in the Bay Area, but she was a student, then she volunteered for us, and then she went on staff for us. Um, and just uh, the video will speak to kind of the transformative power of a community like Front Porch. When you love people with God's radical, um, unconditional love, uh, transformation does indeed happen. A um, couple quick things. Actually, no, I'll show the video, and then I, have, I just want to give you a couple heads up about some things coming up in the Front Porch community, and then I will be available afterwards during the coffee hour, and I'd love to just be present, and anyone who wants to come up and hear more about what we do at Front Porch, I'd love to share with you. So here's, here's the video. If I didn't make it clear, uh, we have a two-story facility that is a coffee house, so we give away free coffee every single day. Um, and it's a place that students come in, that they can sit, that they can study, that they can meet other students. Professors from Cal Poly come and do their office hours at Front Porch with students. Um, and again, it's all believing that if we provide a space that we believe God is actively present in, and then we just pay attention uh, to what's going on and what God is doing, there will be more opportunities than we could ever dream of, of entering into what God is already doing and get to be a part of and entering, in, entering into these students' lives. So um, it's a really beautiful thing. And again, I want to thank you for supporting it. Um, if you want to find out more information beyond what I shared today and beyond what I'll share with you after, um, we have a website. It's frontporchslow.org, and there'll be a lot of information on there. Um, again, your church supports it already. If you're interested in supporting it beyond that, there's opportunities there. If you are on social media and have Instagram, that's kind of lets you know, uh, Front Porch Slow on Instagram, it lets you know what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then on November 4th, I know it's a little ways off, but we're having a big fundraiser up at Cal Poly's, uh, on Cal Poly's campus. If you're really interested in this ministry and want to come here from students directly um, and just see, it's a beautiful, that yearly fundraiser that we do is always a beautiful picture of what Front Porch truly is. We're currently looking at opening another one in Santa Barbara. Um, that's kind of what I'm really excited about right now. And also San Diego. So Front Porch is growing and what we hear from students and parents Parents alike as that the world needs more of these, that college campuses needs more of these, because this is a ministry unlike any other. So again, thanks so much for having me, Steve, um, and I look forward to hopefully meeting you after the service. Okay. Well, let me pray. Let me pray for you. <laughs> I, uh, as you were talking, I, I thought of the words of that hymn, and this can be a prayer that I see Front Porch has uh, locked into. The love of God is broader than the measures of the mind. We know that universities 
are infiltrating the minds of students, but your love is greater, and we pray for this ministry. Pray for Joel. The third day of my freshman year, I was walking by front porch with a few of my dorm friends, and we saw this sign that said, free barbecue tonight. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I hope that this has something to do with Christianity because I'd come to school really wanting that kind of community in my life. And I remember Joel getting up on the stairs, and then he said, I know not everyone here prays, but I follow the teachings of Jesus, and I'm going to pray for our meal. And since that moment, I was hooked. People who leave this community uh, try their best to implement the teachings of Jesus, uh, and that's really why we have this be a community that loves all people. She would stay people. after dinners until every last dish was clean. And a lot of students just come for the meal and take off, and she was always someone said, no, I, I had the meal, but I want to keep helping. I want to keep serving. Do you mind if I show her how to make a pot of coffee if there's one empty? Okay, okay, perfect. I think that Front Porch was a place where I continually went to grow spiritually and also just learning how it meant to love people well and meet them wherever they are in their everyday. It wasn't actually until my sophomore year that I started really going to the Saturday worship gatherings, that I went on my first porch camping trip and it was around then that Front Porch really became my church and it really became the place where I went to find that Christian community. I was so excited when she came up and told me that because I'm like, yes, I've always thought that this is what Front Porch is and now someone's actually identifying Front Porch as the church for them. I have so many friends who come here every single day and a lot of them have no idea that they're sitting in a place that has been blessed and prayed for for years and years. Even if you're not coming here to learn about God. You're experiencing Him every single day in the way that the people treat you here. And for me, that's the love of God. God working through the staff, God working through students. And that's really what my hope is, that every single student who goes to Cal Poly would know about Front Porch, know that it exists, know that it's for them, and that might lead to something more, that might lead to something deeper. There was this one time my junior year I was sitting in Saturday worship gathering, and I remember thinking in my head, oh my gosh, like front porch is like never meant to give me a permanent community. Every single year, like people go out, people come in, and one day, like I'm gonna leave too. But front porch has taught me how to do community. As he seeks to bring that wide mercy of God to this place and that uh, your kindness can be expressed to the students there and uh, that their lives would be full of thanksgiving for the goodness that you bring them through the ministry of Joel, his family, the staff of Front Porch. And I thank you for this church that generously gives. We, we, this church has a generous heart, kind of like that Macedonian church that Ronnie was preaching about. May we continue to, to be a funnel of your mercy through gratefully giving. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Joel. Okay. All right, we'll continue. Join me in the prayer of dedication for our offering. Lord God, you supply all that we need and all that we lack. Your miraculous supply of blessings have no end. Help us to keep our trust in you strong and our faithfulness to you deep. We show our gratitude for your blessings by giving back to you. Accept our offerings to you and guide us to use them for your glory. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, I am convinced that my God will fully satisfy every need you have, for I have seen the abundant of riches of glory revealed to me through Jesus Christ. And God our Father will receive all the glory and honor 
throughout the eternity of eternities. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Now, amazing grace, my chains are gone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved.
And now go in the grace that is yours in Christ Jesus. Lean on him this week. May you know his love in your life. In Jesus' name.